envision this. You finally finished riding for the day and you stood around in a group with your bros and your brolets having a little bit of a discussion about how it went. And then, well, along comes Steve. Now, Steve is the kind of guy who is an advocate for motorcycle safety on the road. And we all need guys like Steve. And he's going to be telling you that every time you go out for a ride, you should be wearing a high-vis jacket. And well, Steve's not the only one. He's going to tell you that his claims are backed by multiple organizations and also insurance companies. That very evening, as I sat with my computer, I started to Google more information about motorcycles and high-vis jackets. Whilst I could find a lot of information encouraging their use, there wasn't really a lot surrounding why. I thought about growing up in the UK and how I'd rush home from school to watch TV and the periodical high-vis road safety campaigns that littered the screen in between ad breaks. I also thought about the fluoro reflectors that quickly became a form of currency at school. But most of all, I thought about how it was just considered common knowledge and how little I actually knew about the statistics behind high-vis jackets. It was that evening that led on to the very start of my descent into two years of madness. I wanted to understand a little bit more about the legalities of high-vis jackets in the UK, and I began by looking at more recent accidents. Whilst I discovered that there was no specific law forcing road users to wear high-vis jackets, what I did find was one particular case which really grabbed my attention. So a few years back, there was a 13-year-old child walking on a grass verge right next to the road after visiting her pet horse. Unfortunately for her, along came a car and inattentively pulled over into the lay-by where she was stood, inadvertently knocking her down and causing permanent brain damage. Now, this went through multiple different court cases and inevitably she was awarded 5 million for her permanent brain damage and ongoing life care. However, her insurance company started to argue the fact that she contributed to her own negligence by failing to wear a high-vis jacket. An inattentive driver hits a child and somehow the child is to blame for what she's wearing. And I suppose the next logical conclusion is that if insurance companies are placing such an emphasis on high-vis jackets, they must make a real tangible difference to avoiding collisions on the road, right? Right? Anyone? So the evidence is actually largely inconclusive. Smaller studies tend to point to the fact that high-vis jackets do actually make a tangible difference, whereas longer studies tend to kind of point to the fact that they don't. So as a whole, we don't actually know if they make a difference or not. So in 2004, one of the largest studies conducted by the University of Nottingham, commissioned by the Department of Transport, specifically looked at motorcycle accidents and high-vis jackets on the road. And the results are quite surprising. A sample size of 1,790 accidents were used in the report, including 1,003 reports from the Midlands Police. Now, the sample size also spanned from 1997 to 2002 and included a whole variety of different ages of bikers. And well, it could be condensed down to three major points. So point number one, motorcycles as a whole have a disproportionately high chance of being involved in a collision on the road, particularly on bends when overtaking and also filtering. Point number two, now two groups of bikers are more inclined to be involved in an accident. These are young inexperienced riders and also older riders who then return back to biking. And point number three, there is a serious issue with bikers being seen on the road, particularly at junctions. So point one is basically just a watered down statistic and point two, again, attributes some of the accidents to just the riding skill of a biker. But point three is particularly interesting because it specifically points out the fact that there is a massive visibility issue of bikers on the road. And this is the thing that I'm very keen to explore. When I first read this report, I jumped to the same conclusion that most people would. If there's such an issue with the visibility of bikers on the road, surely the most logical conclusion would be to dress them up like a lighthouse and send them on their merry way. However, it's so much more complex with that, and I'll explain why. So I carried on deep diving, and I started focusing specifically on RTAs where visibility was one of the primary factors. And it generally narrowed down to two types of situations, which was one where a car driver would simply fail to see a biker, and two, the car driver did see the biker, but failed to correctly judged the speed that the biker was going at and so subsequently you know pulled out in front of them. So just to start with point number two which specifically states that you know the car driver did see the biker they just incorrectly judged their speed so we know automatically that visibility wasn't an issue in this particular circumstance 
So whether the biker was wearing a high vis or not, it's unlikely to make any difference. It was just a case of a misperception of speed. Visibility wasn't an issue. But when we jump back to point number one, which is just simply the case that a car driver didn't see a biker, why weren't car drivers seeing bikers on the road? And do high vis jackets actually make a difference? And although I'd done all of this reading, the primary questions that I had were still left unanswered. I was so frustrated at the lack of evidence and I couldn't really find any answers that would tangibly answer the questions that I had. So inevitably I ended up giving up with my research. I got to the point where I just couldn't find the answers to the questions that I was having. So I put the idea to the back of my mind and I carried on riding and didn't think too much of it. And so for the next six months, high-vis jackets became a topic that no longer plagued my mind. I continued on with my travels as if the conversation with Steve had never occurred. I wasn't going to waste any more time on something that just simply wasn't answerable, especially when I needed to focus on more important things like what area I would visit next. And then it came to the point where I start to pack for my upcoming trip. And one of the requirements is that I would be required to bring a high-vis jacket. And then all of a sudden that door of frustration and unanswered questions blew wide open and I was still in the same situation where I just didn't know if there was a purpose to it. And then before I know it, my research started all over again and I was back to square one. And then I begin to think, maybe I'm looking at this from the wrong direction. Maybe instead of focusing on the accidents and what bikers were specifically wearing, maybe I should be looking at the use of visibility aids to promote safety on the road. So why don't we try looking at where the accidents didn't happen? And then suddenly I was down a brand new rabbit hole, which was visibility aids and collision prevention, which turns out is a lot harder to research than actual accidents that have been recorded. And then finally, I find a piece of research that looks at visibility aids like daytime running lights and high-vis jackets and the effect on collision prevention. And the report largely concluded that visibility aids would be a good thing. But then the research pointed out that of all the motorcycle accidents that happened, 12% were actually using visibility aids like high-vis jackets and daytime running lights. So that's 12% of bikers are still being hit wearing this stuff and I wasn't any closer to getting an answer. And then the research went on to theorize that this number is actually underrepresented because the vast majority of motorcycle accidents are underreported to the police. Not only did I not get the answers that I was craving for the first two questions, but I also had a third question now thrown into the mix, which is 12% of accidents involved bikers wearing high vis jackets. If we are dressing bikers up in high-vis jackets, why are they still being hit? It doesn't make any sense. They were being hit whether they were wearing high-vis jackets and they were being hit whether they were not. Why? So at this point, I put the kettle on. <laughs> so I got my cup of tea, I'm sat down and I'm scrolling through forum posts. Forum post after forum post, social media, Facebook, Twitter, everything. And I'm trying to get a better understanding for what is going on with British roads. And it's the same story time and time again. I wasn't speeding, I was going 30 miles an hour, I was wearing a high-vis jacket, I was braking, I wasn't indicating, I was going straight on, and yet still, cars were pulling out in front of bikers. Still, cars were hitting bikers. There was no reason as to why there would be visibility issues. They were dressed appropriately, they weren't speeding, and yet still this was constantly occurring and always it was just the same story. The driver just simply didn't see the biker. So naturally this led me down a new rabbit hole about hazard perception. So I ended up finding a study from 1996 by a guy called Treisman and effectively he looked at hazard perception and found that when people are you know, driving around in their cars they would often rapidly scan for a singular hazard and often this would lead them to fail to notice any approaching hazards. So that was the first of many pieces of research and in 1998 Mac and Rock ended up developing this concept which was effectively the concept of inattentional blindness and they also pointed out that often when people were directly looking at something they were less likely to perceive it. So towards the end of the 90s, inattentional blindness became such a popular research topic. And we ended up with gem pieces of research like the Gorilla Test. Now, if you're ever wondering why car drivers do not see bikers on the road, I urge you to go and watch the Gorilla Test. And that will answer a lot of questions for you. 
But most importantly, what all the research conducted in the 90s conclusively proved was that inattentional blindness was not just a laboratory curiosity, it had real world implications. After months of plaguing curiosity, I was finally at the end of my quest. The real reason I couldn't find a lot of information on high-vis jackets and motorcycle safety was simply put because there isn't really any. Inattentional blindness is a psychological lack of attention. It has nothing to do with visual defects or deficits. Whilst I was disappointed to learn that there isn't really much I could do to increase my safety on the road, I was equally glad to finally close the book on a question that had tormented me for such a great deal of time. That was until I started to wonder how the development of UK roads could be restructured to accommodate our natural attention 